We decided today to lower the target for the federal funds rate by a quarter of a percentage point to a range of 2 percent to 2 and a quarter percent. The outlook for the U.S. economy remains favorable, and this action is designed to support that outlook. As I'm sure you guys know, this is Jerome Powell. This last Wednesday, the Fed decided to cut rates by 0.25 percent, which was something the market expected. So this is nothing new. But he goes on and he gives a couple of reasons of why he did that, because he just said that the outlook for the U.S. remains favorable. So why are we cutting interest rates? Let's take a listen. It is intended to ensure against downside risks from weak global growth and trade policy uncertainty to help offset the effects these factors are currently having on the economy and to promote a faster return of inflation to our symmetric 2 percent objective. OK, so he wants to increase inflation back to 2 percent. And he's, uh, he's looking at you, Europe, looking at you, Canada, saying global growth is slowing down. This isn't the U.S. This is the rest of the world slowing down and it's affecting the U.S. And he's saying that there's uncertainty with trade policy, which seems to be heating up a little bit, becoming more uncertain. So this is an insurance policy. Now, everybody has their different opinions on whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. I actually, I think something that I said in my last video was a little bit misinterpreted. I'm fine with the Fed lowering rate. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. What I do have a negative outlook on is this whole entire ordeal. I don't think it's a good thing that global growth is slowing and the U.S. is lowering rates. I don't think that that's a good outlook overall. In this video, I want to cover a couple things. One, how do dividend stocks perform in recessions and bear markets? We're going to look at that. Two, what are the chances of us going into a bear market within the next year, the next two years, entering into a recession? We're going to look at that. And three, what you can do to prepare for a recession what you can do with your portfolio, allocation, things to invest in, things to avoid investing in. We're going to go through all of that today. Going back to that first question, how do dividends perform during recessions? How does a dividend portfolio like mine perform during a recession? I think this is a pretty relevant question, especially since you're looking at my portfolio. I have $46,000 into a dividend portfolio. Every single holding I have, I have like 55 different companies plus some bonds that all of it's dispersed through dividends. This is a dividend portfolio. So knowing how this performs during a recession, I think is a very relevant question. It's one that I was interested in, so I did some research. Before I jump into that, I just want to mention one thing. I get so many emails and questions of people saying, hey, can you tell me what holdings you have or can I look at your companies? There's a way to look at that that's really easy. On this video, I'll even show you. You can go to the description here. It says show more, click on that. And then right here where it says main portfolio, this middle one here, you just click into it here. It'll open up and it will look very similar to my portfolio. It has all the holdings, the target allocation, and you can click into any of these sectors and see the holdings. So I just wanted to note that. But like I said, every single company I have returns capital to me residually, incrementally, whatever you want to call it, over time periods, whether it's every single quarter, every single month, it just pays me out money over and over and over again. What I do is I gather up that money and I have this broker automatically invest it into underweight securities and it buys fractional shares of them. You can see me doing that of different companies in the healthcare sector right here. This uh, $26 that apparently happened on the second, I mean, I don't even check anymore. This is just happening all the time. Every single day in the background, I'm making these purchases. This $26 came from dividends. I didn't put this money in. And that's the strategy. Now, of course, that's good to have happen, but I want to know how this portfolio will perform in the recession. Answering this question is kind of tricky because every single recession is different. For instance, in the year 2000, we had the dot-com bubble where these different tech companies, they had completely ridiculous valuations and they came way down from the sky back down to reality. And that dot-com bubble, that, that burst and that caused a bear market. That was different than what we had in 2009 where we had a credit crunch, which hurt the financial sector, on top of a subprime mortgage crisis. So we had two different things go on at the same time, which caused a global crisis and the worst recession we've had. Uh, people compare it to the Great Depression. It was so bad. That happened in 2008, 2009. So we never know exactly what we're going to get, but there is some data on how dividends do during all the different recessions way back until the 1950s. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at that data. I have a chart here. I'm going to throw it up on the screen and it looks a little confusing at first. I'll try to get you oriented here. 
we have three different columns. Off to the left, we have the dates of every single bear market and recession since 1946, going down to the last one being 2008, 2009. In the middle column, we have the S&P 500, which is the, you know, the biggest 500 companies in the US indexed and how they just performed overall, meaning how much the market cap of the S&P 500 fell during those bear markets. And then off to the right, we have the S&P 500's dividend change, meaning did dividends fall and how much did they fall or did they go up during a recession? So we can compare all of this data side by side and it gives you a clear look of if the S&P 500 fell this much during a recession, how much does the dividend income fall? Because like I've said a million times, my focus is more on dividend income and that income growing than it is the market capitalization gains of the company that seem to fluctuate all the time. So I'm interested in how it compares with each other. Now let's go through a couple of these and see if you guys notice any trends, if you can point out any trends on this. 1946 through 1949, this is the first recession. The S&P 500 dropped 30%. The dividend income change was plus 46% during that time. So even though the S&P 500 dropped by 30%, dividend income increased 46% during those three years. 1956 through 1957, the S&P 500 declined 22%. Dividend change, negative 0.1%. 1961 through 1962, the S&P 500 declined 28%. The dividend change was plus 4.1%. 1966 through 1967, S&P 500 declined 22% and the dividend change was negative 1.2%. That means that if you were a dividend investor during 1966 through 1967, even though the S&P 500 went down 22%, your portfolio might have fallen a little bit, but your dividends, the amount of income you're actually getting only fell 1.2%. Uh, we can continue on. 1968 through 1970, the S&P 500 dropped 36%. Dividend change, negative 8.8%. 1973 through 1975, dividends dropped 48%. The S&P 500 almost was cut in half. Your dividend change down to 9.4%. So down, you know, one-fifth as much. 1980 through 1982, the S&P 500 declined 27%. The S&P 500's dividend change, negative 1%. Barely budged, even though the index fell 27%. Uh, going on, we only have a couple more of these. 1987. Negative 34% for the S&P 500. The dividend change, plus 1.9%. So even though the S&P 500 fell 34%, dividend income rose during that year. 1990 through 1991, negative 20% on the S&P 500 and dividends went down 2%. 2000 through 2002, this was the dot-com bubble, negative 49%. That's how much the S&P 500 declined. Dividend change, 0.5%. It went down 0.5%. 2008 through 2009. This is one of the biggest outliers of every single past recession and bear market because dividends didn't just stay steady or fall a little bit. They fell quite a bit. So 2008 through 2009, most of you are familiar, the S&P 500 dropped 57% from its absolute highs to its lowest lows during that time period, while the total dividend income being paid out dropped 23%. Having your income drop 23% is not fun. But even so, the S&P 500 still dropped over double what the dividend income change. So if you actually average out all this data, the S&P 500 on average during a bear market has declined around 33% and the dividend change on average has declined about 0.5%. You know, to me, looking at this chart, I think the data is pretty incredible. You look at how much the S&P 500 declines during these recessions and bear markets, and it's pretty substantial. People will have their portfolio value chopped down 20%, 30%, 50%. And that can be really hard. Mentally, having that happen, I imagine, is very difficult. Anybody that lives through these recessions and has been invested during it, I think it's tough if you see your portfolio value drop that much. I think having your dividends stay pretty steady, not drop hardly as much, I think there's a huge psychological benefit to that. Even if the S&P 500 is able to recover later on, being able to keep your income during that time, being able to know that you're still getting paid out dividends all the time and they're being reinvested and buying those shares at low valuations, I think is a huge benefit that people overlook often. Having that cash cushion 
of money that's paid out in dividends, I think is a huge benefit during recessions of bear markets. But this should give you an idea of how much dividend income is going to drop. It's tricky to say. Sometimes it's gone up during recessions. Sometimes it's kind of stayed flat. Other times it's gone down a little bit. That's usually what happens is it just, it moves somewhat the same direction as the recession, but not nearly as much. 2008 and 2009 were a huge outlier. Dividend income dropped a lot, about half as much as the actual S&P 500 drop. Uh, now, there was some extenuating factors, things I think added to this, added to the severity of the dividend change in 2009. One of them, if you look at this article here, this is Reuters. This was written in 2009 after the bailouts, and it said, Fed to banks don't use bailout funds for dividends. In 2009, when these banks were going belly up and we were about to hit a giant financial crisis, much worse than what we already were, the Fed came and they took over a lot of the banks and they bailed them out. And pretty much what they said is you cannot use this money to pay dividends. So a lot of companies, they were sort of forced to cut down on their dividend payments, um, understandably so. Other than 2009, you can see the majority of the time dividend income hasn't been affected nearly as close to the actual market cap of the S&P 500. When I look at my portfolio, that's something huge for me. I want my dividend income to continually grow. And if we do hit a recession, that's going to be the key that I'm looking at. I know that this green right here, this $4,300, it goes up and down every day. Trump put out a tweet that he was uh, introducing more tariffs and it went down a couple hundred bucks in an instance. In an hour, it went down a couple hundred bucks. What I look at is my dividend income, the pace at which it's growing, that extra passive income. So that's what is important to me. And apparently that's much more of a steady indicator even during recessions. So I hope that gives you some ideas of what you might be able to expect during a recession. You don't know for sure, but the previous examples show that dividend income is typically much less volatile than the actual market cap of the market going up and down. All right, I think it's time for the next question, which if you remember, it was how close are we to a recession? There's a lot of videos on YouTube. There's a lot of predictions that there's going to be a recession sometimes in 2020. Uh, so next year, and I want to take a look at that. Um, one thing I'll say on this note of how close we are to a recession is you can use some common sense here. This is a graph of the S&P 500. You can see since 2009 how much the market has gone up. Markets don't go up forever without any kind of bear market in between. At some point, there is going to be a recession. Howard Marks did an interview about this eight months ago talking about it. The economy has gone upward for almost 10 years. The markets have gone upward for almost 10 years. The too much money phenomenon is certainly underway. It would be a mistake to have as much risk in your portfolio today as you did two years ago, five years ago, or 10 years ago. You have to acknowledge that. I use the term calibrate. Today is not the time for max risk, full risk, or for, in my opinion, evenly balancing offense and defense. Your, your portfolio should be skewed toward less risk. Yes, but not extremely. Now, Howard Marks and Oak Tree in general is a very uh, cautious hedge fund where they, I mean, they actually stick to their name. They actually hedge against the future. He moves forward. He, he's not saying to not invest but he's saying to do so very defensively at this point because there's not as many good deals now as there was 10 years ago or seven years ago or five years ago. Uh, that's kind of his opinion. He's not forecasting the future. Now to actually look at some research and some data points on our chances of going into recession in the next couple of years, I'm gonna look at something called the recession playbook, which is research done by Morgan Stanley. The first piece of data I want to focus on is not just the chances, but what actually causes a recession. Recessions are caused by consumer confidence. When consumers stop spending, when consumers pay decreases, that's when a recession is caused. It says, powered by their pocketbooks, to get a recession, you have to disrupt the activities of Americans' households. In late 2015, early 2016, the industrial side, so the business side, representing about 10% of the U.S. economy, was in recession, but the consumer was unstoppable. So the economy continued to motor along in expansion. The U.S. consumer is roughly 70% of the economy, and the U.S. cannot be in a recession without its participation. Hear that last part? If the consumer is confident in still spending their money and still has money to spend, we cannot go into a recession. The fastest way to stunt consumer behavior is to hit them in their pocketbooks, and that comes through a labor market. More than 80% of American households rely on labor market income. So that's saying that people rely on their jobs. They go, they clock in eight or nine in the morning, and they make their money and they leave. 
If they get laid off, if they get fired, if they have a hard time finding work, if they have to accept part-time work, that's what causes a recession. The consumer is what determines whether we're in a recession or not. Now over here, we actually start getting into some predictions. Morgan Stanley, uh, their probability indicator, looking at just all the current data points, they give a 13% chance of a recession in the next 12 months. Now you might look at that and say 13%, yeah, that's, I mean, it's double digits, but that's not too bad, it's still really low. But they also highlight other concerns that can't really be tied into these data points. And they say that subjectively, the risk of a recession is more around 20% in the next 12 months. Uh, that's quite a bit higher. So just with all the pure data points, no subjective research, they think it's around 13%. With uh, other things outside of just the things you can quantify, like the tariffs and the concerns about that, they, they peg it right around 20%. So the range of recession within the next 12 months by Morgan Stanley, they say is somewhere between 13% and 20%. Now, I want to move on and answer the last question, which I think is one of the most interesting ones, which is what do we do with our portfolio if we think we're going into a recession? So, I mean, it's great and all to know the probability of going into recession. Oh, great. We might have a 20% chance of one in the next 12 months. Well, that doesn't leave you with a lot of information. You need to know what can I, what can I do that's actually actionable. They have some data on this of the type of things that do well during a recession and the type of things that don't do well. For instance, one of the data points is equities and credit are most vulnerable while bonds outperform during a recession. Most of us, I think, already know that, that bonds are pretty good in a recession. Uh, they will hold their value more than equities will. Now, there's another data point that I think will surprise many people. Ex-U.S. risk assets tend to see bigger drawdowns than U.S. markets during U.S. recessions. That's a way of saying that foreign assets like Europe, Canada, uh, emerging markets, they see bigger drawdowns during a U.S. recession than U.S. assets do. That actually surprised me. A lot of people look at Europe, they look at Canada and emerging markets as places to, to be safe havens during a U.S. recession. If the U.S. recession is tanking, then you should put your money outside of the U.S. That seems like pretty common sense logic there, but that it doesn't turn out that way. With how global the economy is, the U.S. is a giant consumer. We buy stuff from everywhere and import it from everywhere. So when the consumer stops buying things here, yeah, it sends us into a recession in the U.S. It does not help Europe at all either. It doesn't help Canada at all either. And their markets will likely fall even further than the U.S., which is a pretty amazing piece of data there. I was aware that the rest of the world would fall as well, but I didn't think that they would fall more than the U.S. So that's a pretty surprising piece of data there. Now, to finish off this point of where you should put your money during a recession, we can get a little bit more granular because so far the advice we have from them is the U.S. tends to have smaller drawdowns than the rest of the world during a U.S. recession, which is very odd. And then the kind of common sense advice of, bonds do really well during a recession. They outperform other asset classes. Um, they have some more granular information than that if you wanna look into it. For instance, persistent outperformance, which means these are throughout lots of recessions, these are things that have outperformed. Healthcare and staple, food, beverage, tobacco, healthcare equipment and services, pharmaceuticals, biotech, life sciences tend to perform on an absolute and relative basis. Persistent underperformance, these are things that have consistently underperformed during recessions, autos and tech hardware. Autos and tech hardware have a strong tendency to continue weakening through a recession. I don't own any autos. I don't like the industry. Uh, there's just not any car companies that I'm really interested in investing in. I think it's an extremely difficult industry in general. It doesn't surprise me that it performs bad during recessions. Tech hardware is another industry that I do not like, and I don't have a lot in tech hardware. Apple's probably the biggest one I have with that. So hopefully that gives you some ideas how dividend income does during recession, our chances of going into one and things you guys can do with your portfolios to somewhat prepare for one. So I'm going to move on from this and answer a few of your guys' questions. You can email me at josephcarlsonshow at gmail.com or you can message me on Twitter and Instagram. I get a lot of questions that way. So I'm going to be going through a couple of them here. The first one says, hi, Joseph. Awesome overview on the Fed cutting rates. A few questions. One, where do you get your financial education? Two, when you buy stocks, do you pay a commission? Uh, before I read the rest of that second question, I'm going to answer the first one. Where do you get your financial education? So a lot of this was from my parents. My dad in particular was big into finance and he, he talked about it all the time. I mean, I got messages of, 
avoiding debt, that it, it just cripples people's financial situations. Uh, he constantly said things like people that understand interest, they earn it, they don't pay it. So that's part of it. Another part is just reading a lot. I mean, it's a huge interest of mine. I read about it a lot. For instance, that Morgan Stanley research on the recession playbook was about 70 pages long. I read the entire thing. So that's just something recent. I uh, read financial journals all the time as well as just study this topic for a, a pretty long time. So I'd say a lot of it's self-taught, a lot of it's influenced by uh, people close around me. The next question, when you buy stocks, do you pay commissions? There is no access to M1 Finance in Europe, so I have to use a local broker to buy stocks. They charge me a small fee every time I buy stocks, so it makes sense to buy in larger orders, $1,000, instead of investing $10. Do you think that would have a significant negative impact on my portfolio growth since this is not compounding as much as yours? This question has a little bit of nuance to it. So if you're using a broker that charges a fee, you, need to, you do need to ball your purchases up into larger dollar amounts. This is going to impact your compounding more the lower portfolio value you have. So if you only have a couple thousand dollars, yeah, you're not going to have as much compounding with dividends. You're not going to have hardly any. Um, I'm, once you start getting up higher and higher amounts of equity, the fees that you're paying become less and less relevant until you get to a point where if you have over you know $50,000 plus, it's not as big of a factor there. So this is going to affect your compounding negatively. I wouldn't say that it's going to be significantly negative. Uh, one thing people need to understand is that dividend growth investing, this idea of only investing in companies that increase your dividends and pooling those together and purchasing shares, that is not something that is tied to M1 Finance. M1 Finance as a broker, I think, fits with the strategy really well, but dividend growth investing as a strategy has has been around for a very long time. There's major institutions that have done it. There's lots of private investors that have done it uh, for a very long time on completely different brokers that have charged fees. So this strategy was around long before M1 even existed. And I don't think that M1 is the only way that you can implement it. You just have to work with the broker you have to minimize costs. Sounds like you're doing that already. The next question says, hi, Joseph, great video and great channel. Are you planning to make a video or at least part about the best dividend European stocks? Please don't forget your European friends from France. Okay, so this one, um, yeah, I don't have, I don't think I have any European stocks right now. I have a couple Canadian banks. Uh, really, so people might ask why I don't have anything invested in Europe right now. There's a couple reasons why. I would say the first one is probably ignorance. I live in the US. I see the names of US companies all the time. And so I recognize them more. I recognize the products they sell. It becomes a little bit easier to invest in things that you easily recognize that you're exposed to, um, that you're part of that market. Not being in Europe, I don't know the market there. I don't really know what companies are as big and what direction they're headed. I just don't have the same level of nuance that I'm sure a lot of Europeans have. So there's probably a lot of Europeans that listen to my videos and they go, man, I don't know why he's not invested in this company or this company in Europe. And part of the reason why is because I don't know as much about them as you do. Uh, not being there, I just don't know as much about it. Now, another part of it, at least in my understanding, is some of the companies I actually do recognize from Europe are in industries that I don't invest in altogether. For instance, there's some European oil companies. I don't have a lot invested in oil companies. I'm not really planning on buying that much more of them. Another one is the automakers. Europe makes probably some of the best cars along with Japan, which is great, but I just don't invest in autos. It's too complicated of an industry. There's too many moving parts with it. It's just not an industry I like to invest in to begin with. So even though Europe makes fantastic cars, I just haven't invested in it. Outside of that, I will say one company that I have been looking at investing in is HSBC Bank. It's a very big dividend paying bank. They've been in some previous scandals and stuff, but I don't know what company hasn't at this point. But really, they pay a really steady dividend. They're a really big dividend payer. That's one that I've been looking to add to my portfolio, and I probably will down the road. I just have so many holdings as it is right now. So I need to have an excuse or reason to add that one to my portfolio. But HSBC is one of the ones I've been looking at from Europe. So the next question says, hey, Joe, I'm really interested in wanting to invest. Between me and my wife, we make about $950 a week. I was wanting to make passive income, but I'm new to this. Could you tell me what and how is the best way to get started, what to invest in, and how? Thank you for your time. I'm enjoying your YouTube videos. All right, so I see uh, that there's kind of two different routes you can go down. And I'll just highlight each one, and you can decide which one you think would be best for your own situation. So one of them is if you want a portfolio, like my main one that I show off on the videos, 
the, that comes with picking individual companies, individual stocks. And that is something I would only do if you're very comfortable doing that. If you if you know how to research companies, if you're confident in, in your picks, if you're not going to be changing your portfolio around all the time, if you're constantly swapping out holdings and constantly changing it, you're probably going to get diminished returns doing that. So with this strategy, one caveat I would say is that I have a lot of holdings, especially for somebody just starting off with lo lower dollar amounts. I get asked all the time what I would invest in if I had $1,000. I would still break it down into sectors like mine, but in each sector, instead of having like nine or 10 holdings, I would reduce it to like two or three max. So I would just pick like the top two or three in each sector and start off with those. I would start building up my position in those companies because when you have less money to work with, it's gonna be spread a little thin having 50 or 60 holdings. Now there's another option for people that don't really like the idea of picking individual companies, but they still want the passive income. That is exactly what my Roth IRA does. So my Roth IRA is also on M1 Finance. This is my retirement account. And it follows the same principles of dividend growth investing where, where every single holding in all of these ETFs, they pay dividends. So every single company that these ETFs hold, they pay dividends. And these ETFs pay really good dividends monthly and quarterly. The benefit of this type of route where you pick these different ETFs is that you never have to pick individual stocks. You can literally go in, adjust the percentages you want of bonds to equities of these different ETFs. Once it's adjusted, you set it, you forget it, you never have to worry about it again. All you have to worry about is putting money in. And one thing I will say, if you're just starting off, the amount of money that you can contribute and how consistently you can contribute it is going to be the biggest factor of you building up your portfolio. Really, uh, for dividend growth investing, you need to have a certain amount of capital before you really start seeing it push off that dividend income. So try to just build up your portfolio as fast as you can and you'll start to see those dividends roll in. But that's what I would do. I would look at what type of personality you are. If you want to do research and select companies that you're really comfortable in, then I would do something more similar to my main portfolio. I would just reduce the amount of holdings. Uh, if you're not really interested in picking individual holdings, if that is something that just causes a lot of stress and you're always second guessing yourself, do something more like my Roth IRA. The links for both these portfolios are in the description of the video. So you can use those for reference as a starting point there. I'm going to leave it there. Um, if you guys haven't already, hit the subscribe button. Also, this is a podcast as well. So we're on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, um, all those things as well. And I'll have another video out for you soon. I'll catch you guys next time.